Okay, thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this very interesting and interdisciplinary event. I learned a lot this morning. Uh, I'm going to change uh, discipline and uh, uh, the tone of uh, our conversation, perhaps. But I'm sure you will be generous in tolerating the social science idiom that I'm now going to use. What I'm trying to do is to give you an uh, idea about what I call the, I mean, a benign term, a political theory of populism. Politi in general, it is axiomatic, I think, that you call something a theory that can possibly be wrong. And uh, as I will argue, this happens to be the case with the political theory of populism, which uh, plays an important role in the current uh, situation and the political conflicts of Europe and far beyond, including the United States, from where most of my illustrations and examples will come. But I skip about half of my manuscript for the sake uh, of time. My plan for the present paper is as follows. In the first part, I describe a rough model of uh, a democracy. Uh, liberal democracy is a pleonasm. This has been pointed out, so I speak of democracy. And its three defining properties or dimensions, the enigmatic term of a queue is uh, yeah, it is not a deal, right? Yes, are you sure? Yeah. yeah. Do I make myself understood? Okay, fine. So um, the cube uh, is something that has three dimensions, and I use these three dimensions in a fairly conventional political science way. Um, I describe a rough model of. Uh, a democracy and the three defining properties that make up, or dimensions that make up the cube. These dimensions are equivalent to the three conventional concepts of politics, the polity, and policy. The English language allows us to differentiate these three. In German, it is all politic, and no one knows what it means. So. Um, uh, and this is equivalent, uh, interestingly, to the three stages developed by D.H. Uh, Marshall uh, of uh, political modernization, uh, with first uh, uh, the rule of law, polity, being invented in the 18th century, then in the 19th century, the politics, of democratic class struggle, as Seymour Martin Lipset has put it, uh, is added. And in the 20th century, according to T.H. Marshall, uh, the interventionist welfare state has been uh, developed. So these, these are the, uh, it's a small uh, conceptual uh, exercise. Uh, in the second part, I explore the main features of populism as it has emerged as a powerful political force in almost all advanced countries. Here, I focus on the core ideas and assumptions of the implicit political theory of the new populism emerging within democracies. The final part of the paper highlights two paradoxes or inconsistencies from which this political theory suffers and which suggests that the political practices inspired with, uh, with it, by it are likely to fail. So what do we mean by democracy? What we mean by uh, democracy is a form of political regime 
that so far has only been accomplished within states. And that is uh, bad news for the European Union, which is not a state. It is plainly no longer the only game in town in Europe. Democracy is plainly no longer the only game in town in Europe. As authors such as uh, Francis Fukuyama writing after 1989 at the end of the Soviet Union wishfully try to make us believe. The essence of liberal democracy can perhaps be visualized as this three-dimensional uh, entity, the cube. Um, the first dimension is that of popular sovereignty. Political rule derives from and is legitimated by the will of the people. The supreme authority of the people manifests itself in elections and many other forms of political communication and participation through which political elites are held accountable, thereby making these elites representative agents. There are two well-known problems um, with uh, popular sovereignty and the will of the people. First, what counts as the will of the people is always an artifact of the institutionalized methods by which it is being observed and assessed. These institutionalized measurement techniques are typically co codified in electoral laws and laws regulating activities of political parties. For instance, the popular will, as it is assessed through elections, can greatly vary according to whether it is ascertained through majoritarian or proportional electoral methods or federal versus unitary forms of state. It can also be measured by opinion polls and referenda. To illustrate the artificiality of what counts as the will of the people, think of the divergence between the popular majority and the generated <coughs> and uh, the uh, majority generated by the peculiar American institution of an electoral college in the last American presidential elections. Moreover, the will of the people is an elusive non-entity because of its diversity and plurality, as well as the malleability and instability in the temporal dimension. If it were not unstable in the temporal uh, dimension, we would not need electoral campaigns and uh, controversies over opinions in the media and other arenas of the public sphere. So it's a very fluid, hard to grasp entity. Second, however, before the popular will can at all be expressed and assessed, it must be formed through processes of political preference building with their cognitive and motivational components. Most people most of the time do not have a reasonably clear, elaborate, robust and consistent view or opinion on most polit uh, policy issues. Better? On most, uh, there is a noise in here for which I, uh, I'm not causing it, but uh, the system causes it. Uh, so most people do not have, and you can test yourself, a clear-cut opinion on most issues most of the time. Uh, uh, and uh, if you have an opinion, it may be you have a different opinion the day after tomorrow because you learned something, you talked to something, you read something, and so So I want to highlight the fluidity of what, uh, 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 the political will of the people. The political will of the people is contingent on the framing operations, issue agendas, and management of saliences of those who uh, ask the questions. The uh, German political uh, theorist Ernst Wolfgang Birkenförde has emphasized that the political will 
of the people as the nature is in the nature of an answer. Uh, it is not a proposition, it is an answer to a question. And uh, it all depends who asks the question and which uh, questions. Note that preferences and the policies to which they refer cannot possibly lay claim to any truth value, although, of course, true propositions, as well as untrue ones, as they were formed famously instrumental in cases ranging from the Iraq war to the Brexit decision about the world. Uh, um, enter into the, for, uh, I mean, propositions enter into the formation of preferences and policies. But preferences cannot be true. They are fluid and contingent. Were we to deny the fact that political preferences and policy choices de derived from them cannot possibly be true, if we were to deny this, we would be on our way to repeat the errors and horrors that have occurred under the regime of so-called scientific state socialism and the truth claims of its ideologies. Political preference formation is partly a matter of strategic action on the part of political parties and elites, on media and educational institutions, and partly the outcome of ongoing processes of lived experience. Citizens form preferences by using the three politically relevant capacities they have. Uh, and that is uh, basic, but let me repeat it anyway. These three capacities they have are reason, interest, and identity. And they are not more than that, and all three of them uh, play a role in political will formation. Uh, by using these three capacities, uh, and responding to political elites, invoking and appealing to them, people continuously learn and find out about and forge their genuine preferences, that is, whom they should vote for and which policies to support or oppose. Uh, let me cut this short. The second dimension of what I have called the liberal democracy cube or the democracy cube consists in the constitutional order, specify, which specifies, among other things, the rights that all citizens are equally endowed with, and which constitute them as citizens, as citizens, and the rules by which collectively binding decisions are to be made, basically everything that is written in constitutions, uh, including rule of law principles, such as the division of powers and the independence of the judiciary. It also includes international treaties, conventions, and other legally binding commitments to which governments of nation states have decided to become parties. This legal and constitutional armor of liberal democracy performs two functions which seemingly contradict each other. On the one hand, the guarantee, by guaranteeing legal rights and entitlements, they enable citizens to engage freely in all kinds of activities, in markets, in politics, in their private life, and their fa uh, as family members, as consumers, as worshippers, as researchers, as labor market participants, and so on. On the other hand, so they have this strong enabling function. Uh, on the other hand, they provide for powerful constraints on the kind of activities they are permitted to engage in, including the beliefs and preferences they are allowed to pursue and practice in political life. Citizens are denied the right to interfere with the rights of others, as well as with the orderly conduct of justice. They are not allowed to use their rights and resources for unconstitutional or otherwise illegal uh, aims and uh, purposes. I mean, if you ask uh, uh, the 
uh, that it was used to be true st uh, through the 70s. It's no longer. If you ask the population of Germany whether or not they are in favor of, the, of capital punishment, uh, you would get a small majority in favor. At the same time, the Constitution says the death penalty is abolished. Right? So this is a preference that does not is constitutionally hindered to play a role in political life. Uh, citizens are denied the, the right to interfere with the rights of others as well as with the orderly conduct of justice. They are not allowed to use the, the rights and resources for unconstitutional or otherwise illegal aims. The legal order has therefore been compared by Stephen Holmes uh, to the force of gravity. It allows us, the force of gravity allows us to go upright, but hinders us from flying. That is to say, even if a vast majority of the population were uh, in favor of open discrimination of uh, particular groups in the population, that would not be constitutionally permitted. So the will of the people is uh, uh, encapsulated into a, an institutional order. The third dimension of our democracy queue is stateness or state capacity or as a term in recent uh, uh, political science literature is governing capacity. Barack Obama, electorally, Barack Obama's electorally highly successful, yet ultimately only poorly redeemed campaign slogan, slogan, yes we can, addressed exactly the problem of state capacity. As did the German Chancellor's even far less redeemed slogan, wir schaffen das meaning we'll get that done, namely that being the uh, migration uh, uh, issue, which was uh, promulgated when she was facing the refugee crisis in the summer of 2015. Being legitimated both by the will of the people and the legal constitutional order, agencies of democratic states must be capable of getting things done. That is, follow up on uh, declared intentions and policy objectives. Political promises must be kept, laws enforced, policies executed, peace restored, programs implemented. More often than not, against the resistance and attempted obstruction of interested non-state actors, and frequently by overcoming the interference of uh, or non-cooperation of other states. What is it that is to be done? There, uh, there has always been a vast variety of collectively relevant issues and objectives addressed by state policies. Um, and this, fact, uh, in let, uh, uh, this in fact led uh, Max Weber to insist on defining the state not by its end, but by, by its means namely by being endowed with a monopoly over the means of legitimate violence and physical coercion. Yet the ends of, the state, of state policies can still be categorized at the most abstract level as belonging to the two overarching functions to provide security and opportunity, security and opportunity. By performing these functions, um, arguably in a highly inequitable way, but, but by performing these functions, the state acquires what is sometimes referred to by political scientists at, as output legitimacy. It is legitimate for what it accomplishes through state capacity. Uh, even if it lacks input and process legitimacy, I leave that uh, to the side. The kind, volume, and distribution of the basic goods of security and opportunity is a matter of ongoing democratic politics. At any rate, the state's unrivaled coercive capacity to carry out the policies that emerge from politics is a third constituent component, in fact, a 
basic requirement of what we mean by democracy. State failure, the inability to perform the functions of security and uh, opportunity. State failure occurs if the state turns out to lack the requisite capacity to provide for security opportunity related institutions and policy packages, the content of which is defined by the will of the people as well as by the constitutional mandates to which governments and state agencies are subject. Only a capable state can be a democratic state. In contrast, a state that controls just, say, weights and measures and decides on street names and nothing else cannot possibly be called a democratic state. In order to build adequate governing capacity or state capacity, the state must, first of all, be able to extract uh, material uh, resources, then it uh, needs also uh, personal resources that are reasonably corrupt, corruption immune and are reasonably competent and trained. I'm not going into Max Weber's theory of bureaucracy, but it's all in, in there, uh, the resources that the state needs in order to perform the functions of security and opportunity. Uh, have been steadily growing over the last hundred years and are still, as is shown by the evidence of high levels and increasing levels of indebtedness, not uh, finalized. I consider the problem of deficient state capacity in all of the dimensions as hinted at to be the single most serious problem we encounter in contemporary, uh, contemporary democracies. Even if the executive branch of government and the administrative apparatus performs according to universalistic standards, social and economic forces, domestic ones as well as those operating from beyond the borders of a state's territory, can and do in fact often obstruct or distort or disfigure intended policy outcomes, thus undermining the effectiveness of state action. States are rendered virtually incapable by economic forces beyond their control to effectively fulfill their functions of providing security and opportunity. These forces consist of private firms, corporations, banks, the holders of capitalist rights to make autonomous decisions on investment, location, employment and finance. Without too much simplification, we can speak of a reversal that has taken place and is still going on throughout the OECD world. It used to be the case that the market economy was, as the term was, was uh, widely used, was Im embedded in state-organized institutions and the regulations which maintained the upper hand over market dynamics. This has radically changed as many observers have pointed out, today we see states embedded in markets rather than the other way around. And their governing capacity and effectiveness decimated and undermined accordingly, namely by the ongoing anticipation of adverse responses coming from the holders of those capitalist rights. And if, um, we look at any newspaper's front page on uh, current events and developments in Italy to illustrate the point. There's often very little the states can do as individual states when facing global challenges such as climate change and environmental protection, mass migration beyond state borders, global health issues, transnationally organized crime and terrorism. At the same time, states have themselves become economic agents competing with other states above all for capital investment with the action parameters of competition being uh, the unit cost of labor, which is the, the decisive variable in the national economy, the levels of taxation and the regulation they impose upon investors, the customs on imports and the uh, uh, debt uh, they incur look at the current debate on the Brexit mess to, uh, to, for illustration. 
what kinds of security and opportunity would minimally effective states be capable of providing? Here we have the three uh, uh, areas of uh, state action, military and police security, uh, protecting citizens from uh, violence coming from inside or outside the state territory. Second, social and economic protection, um, uh, including all areas of economic policy and um, social policy. And thirdly, and not to forget, the provision and preservation of cultural goods and facilities, such as this wonderful building, uh, that is schools, museums, opera houses, concert halls, universities, libraries, and many others. Uh, what the sociologist calls the institutions of cultural reproduction. Given uh, the constraints imposed upon states' governing capacity by globalization, financialization, and the competitive pressures just mentioned, what governments and the parties forming them can actually accomplish is typically not sufficient for them to earn the recognition and support of citizens. States are seen as failing states by national constituencies, and that is not just the case, but particularly strongly the case since the 2008 uh, uh, financial market and uh, uh, euro uh, crisis. Before I look at the defining features of populist political forces in more detail, let me highlight three frictions that exists among uh, these three constitutive dimensions of democracy. One is effectiveness uh, versus the institutional legal order. An example illustration, Germany is a federalist state. If it were not federal, uh, uh, educational reform would be much easier. Uh, uh, to accomplish. Second tension, uh, popular sovereignty conflicts with the constitution. People do uh, form preferences that are incompatible with constitutional uh, rule of uh, law and international legal regulations. And here is a clear, and migration questions are a clear. Uh, uh, case in point. And the third uh, tension is effectiveness versus uh, the uh, uh, popular will. In order to be effective, for instance, uh, uh, effective in uh, regulating uh, uh, traffic, uh, regulating energy consumption, uh, uh, regulating uh, 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 waste processing and many other things, uh, regulating uh, also uh, migration and integration issues. You need the active support of civil society, the enlightened understanding of citizens, what their role in the, uh, uh, is. The state cannot ev do everything alone, but if the supportive uh, understanding on the part of citizens and civil society is absent, effectiveness uh, cannot be guaranteed to, uh, to uh, say the least. Let me say a few things about uh, populism. The rise of populism is the single most dramatic and consequential development in capitalist democracies in the early decades of the 21st century. I don't think there can be much uh, disagreement uh, uh, on this uh, proposition, a uh, uh, few uh, features. The politics uh, of populism is a highly emotional and more specifically highly aggressive politics uh, driven by protest, anger, hate and fear. It targets in Europe, its targets in Europe are the Economic and Monetary Union, migration, EU uh, integration general, uh, globalization. It is largely negative politics, to quote Max Weber again, rallying people behind items that are to be feared, protested against and resisted. Pol populists thrive on fears, 
that they stuck rather than on a remedy and remedial policy that they offer uh, and uh, advocate. Uh, the second point is that populism relies on a personalistic style of uh, uh, leadership uh, and uh, on the view that uh, there is one um, consistent true will of the people uh, against whom uh, there are, uh, against which there are uh, just uh, traitors and uh, uh, opponents. I can elaborate on this with a few examples uh, later. A third feature is the reliance on a uh, rhetoric of provocation, normative standards of civility, decency, good taste, nonviolence, respect for opponents, moderation, toleration, political correctness are systematically violated. I've, I find this, uh, I read somewhere a um, uh, analysis, linguistic analysis of the inaugural speech of uh, uh, President Trump, uh, where there was not a single reference to normative standards such as freedom or peace or uh, uh, democracy uh, or equality that we usually are used at such opportunity totally normatively, totally empty. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, at the same time, uh, massive violations of uh, the uh, dignity and uh, reputation of other groups of citizens. A fourth point is that the social and political world is framed by post, uh, uh, populist uh, as consisting of two front lines. One is the, the uh, very familiar front line between the people and the establishment, the, the horizontal, if you wish, uh, front line of opposition. We, the people, uh, against the uh, establishment. The other front line is that uh, between us and the outsiders. This is the... Uh, uh, this is the vertical fr uh, front line, right? Uh, us and, uh, the, uh, uh, and the others. Um, us and foreign items to be kept out. Uh, people, other people, other races, other ideas, investment, contagious diseases, crimes, Brussels, foreign gods and foreign goods. Even the use of foreign languages, uh, such as uh, primarily English, that has been uh, attacked by speakers of the German AFD, the Populist Party in, in Germany. They should not speak English, right? Um, because this is a foreign language and that undermines our uh, ethnic community. The front line manifests itself in nativist, xenophobic tendencies the insistence on youth sanguinis, doctrines of citizenship, an ethnic understanding of national community and its dominant culture, in German, light culture, and national religious traditions that are to be protected through walls, fences, and strongly exclusionary legal arrangements. This aggressive insistence on the protection of ethnic identity must clearly be seen as a widely popular backlash to the experience of neoliberal globalization. Yet the economic fears of offshoring and invest, uh, offshoring investment and jobs are to a large extent empirically misplaced. Jobs are not prim primarily threatened by being shifted abroad. That applies to just about 20% of jobs losses in the OECD world. But by disappearing under the impact of mostly domestic automation and artificial intelligence, the other 80%. Um, and that is to say nothing uh, here about the uh, prospects of secular stagnation and the jobless caused uh, by this. In terms of economic, trade, security, and sometimes also social policy, uh, the current US administration has set the standard. 
It consists of the package of uh, economic protectionism, isolationism, and ever more severe exclusionary migration control. Taken together, the construct of two front lines, the vertical and the horizontal, amounts to a, a, a substitution move. What seemingly can no longer be accomplished under conditions of neoliberal globalization through protective state policy and adequate governing capacity must instead be achieved through strengthening the state borders and the defense of state sovereignty that is sh shielded from foreign interference. Populist slogans promulgated in many languages converge on taking back our country, a mystic collective property of homeland, Heimat in German, that all kinds of evil actors, foreign as well as domestic, have dispossessed us of. The, the emphasis on state borders instead of state capacity and state executive. Okay, I have, I have to uh, uh, come to an end with one, one conclusion uh, that I want to leave you with. And uh, that is the following. I'm the, addressing the question of populism and international cooperation about which we have talked this morning uh, and EU integration. Today we seem to have arrived at an age of non-cooperation, and that is contrary to what one colleague said uh, on the previous panel. Today we seem to have arrived at an age of non-cooperation where the world is framed as a zero-sum game immersed in moral hazard psychology. As we all know from the collective action uh, a tradition in uh, the political economy. Uh, there are two problems. Uh, uh, one problem is uh, the collective action problem with the figure of the free rider, those who do not uh, contribute as they should in order to create collective goods. The other and arguably even more important uh, problem is the problem of negative externalities. Whatever we do, we affect others in negative ways. Uh, and uh, uh, to use some illustration from political economy, um, not the deluge after us, the deluge besides us, the contemporaneous synchronic deluge is uh, what is the problem. Look at the political economy of energy consumption, of uh, cotton consumption, of soybean consumption, of uh, palm oil consumption in the advanced countries. The negative externalities that this involves on the ecology of places like Uzbekistan uh, or Indonesia uh, 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 or Brazil for, for soybeans are enormous and entirely uncompensated. I mean, we in the rich countries uh, dump negative externalities on uh, the majority of uh, uh, the uh, global population without compensating uh, them. And these two uh, problems, free riding and uh, uncompensated dumping of negative externalities are uh, uh, at the core of uh, uh, the problem that uh, populists are consistently unwilling to recognize. We seem to have an age of non-cooperation driven by populist uh, uh, doctrines. In the winner countries of the, Euro uh, of the Economic and Monetary Union, um, a populist uh, stage in anti-EU mobilization uh, that has been quite successful. Uh, and the question uh, is, in Germany as well as elsewhere, why should we share our resources with them, the losers, 
whose losses are deserved due to their wrong economic model and wrong economic behavior. Eurobonds and other forms of debt mutualization have become a virtual taboo strictly observed by nearly all sides under the threat of strengthening populist mobilization. If we pay for them, our populists will win the next elections. There is a new ethos in international politics and European politics even, new ethos of going it alone, of resentful unilateralism to, to be seen in the Brexit campaign, of putting ourselves first, to quote uh, the American president, and of taking back control of our country. The cancellation of international agreements, Paris, Iran, and regional uh, secessionist demands, Catalonia, Scotland, Flanders, and others, seem to have become quite popular ambitions in contexts where it identity passions take precedence over both interests and reason. As to um, the demographic gap of aging Western societies in view of which migration is sometimes justified, the German Populist Party now proclaims uh, that we should uh, reproduce ourselves rather than solve our, uh, our demographic problems through migration. Uh, um, and that was very drastic in the recent uh, campaign of 19, uh, 2017. On the one hand, there is an irresistible and irreversible trend of globalization and growing interdependencies. Protectionism, isolationism, unilateralism are getting ever more expensive in terms of self-inflicted damages from which advocates of those strategies are likely to come to suffer. Uh, they forego massive cooperation rents because they fail to organize collective action at a transnational level. The least we can safely claim that is, is that going it alone is, as a, is a rule that only very rarely results in spontaneous win-win situations and outcomes. Wherever it does not, it needs to be regulated and it, its losers compensated to the extent they cannot adjust by their own means. I very much uh, agree to what someone said about uh, competition being a very uh, uh, double-edged sword and uh, something that should not be considered or confused with a value in itself. I describe this as growing long-distance causation to which no state, corporate actor or even individual person is immune be it in the economic, commercial, financial, military, cultural, environmental, technological, or migration dimensions. Whatever we do, we affect knowingly and intentionally or otherwise very remote other agents, be they uh, remote in time or space. We also generate, or at any rate must face, challenges that require large-scale cooperation in order to cope with as they are uh, too big to be dealt with uh, at uh, even the level of the biggest state actors. It has been quipped that there are two kinds of states in Europe. One are small states, and the others are states that have not yet understood that they are small states. Um, and um, I come from the latter category here. Yeah. Um, Examples are climate, uh, uh, climate and other types of uh, environmental change, monetary policy, migration, trade policy, R&D, international peace developments. I've, I've, this is so, uh, uh, obvious. If you do not cooperate, you lose, as the uh, uh, British and the Americans are soon going to uh, recognize. Is there any uh, solution to conclude to the plain paradox between a growing need for cooperation resulting from complexity, interdependency, 
and long distance causation, and the declining supply of cooperation that is driven by populist mobilization. If there is any such resolution, it would have to start with a simple insight. That, however, is extremely hard to implement. In the climate of populism and proliferating cult of going it alone, the insight I suggest is this. Sovereignty, that is our state capacity to, to cope with problems, risks and challenges affecting all, all of us beyond national borders, sovereignty can actually increase when states are ready to give up parts of it for the sake of cooperation. They can master, as these states can master challenges only if they give up the ambition to mastering them alone. The other paradox is this. Given the increase of inequality and precariousness within today's advanced societies and the numerous and severe social pathologies from drug abuse to divorce rates that are well known to be causally associated with inequality. Why has the new post-materialism of identity politics, ethnic nationalism and cultural wars become, has come to hold sway over political mobilizations of both the left and particularly the right? Uh, why um, are those most affected by socioeconomic deprivation ready to support in the name of national identity political forces that clearly and foreseeably deepen their deprivation? A fantastic book by Ali Hochschild uh, discusses this in uh, the case uh, by the title of Strangers in our own land, you know, studying the uh, in Louisiana, the, uh, the the rural proletariat. Again, any resolution of this seeming paradox can emerge only from the dynamics of pra pragmatic learning pressures, suggesting that the politics of identity and national particularism must be replaced with at least a politics of interest rightly understood, if not a politics of progressive ideas. Thank you very much.